won the hits. Didn't do it, though. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, we have reports from Dan Novak, Gregory Stockel, and Gina Bennett. You'll want to listen to the Higher Education Report, which looks at American-style academic writing. Then, Ana Mateo joins us for Words and Their Stories. And now, here's Dan Novak. Government scientists are aiming to replace coral at seven places off the Florida Keys Island group. But the Associated Press reports three-fourths of the newly cultivated coral has died because of warm water temperatures. The scientists are with the U.S. agency known as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. They planted staghorn and elkhorn coral as part of the agency's mission, Iconic Reefs Effort, first announced in 2019. The corals are being grown on structures in shallow water. The two species of coral are considered threatened. The scientists wanted to see how the cultivated species were doing. They visited five places where they had planted coral earlier. They hoped the coral had survived water temperatures reaching 30 degrees Celsius or more during the summer and fall. Last summer, students and volunteers tried to rescue the corals by removing them and temporarily putting them in tanks. But most of the coral did not survive. Noah said only 22% of the 1,500 repopulated staghorn corals that they saw were still alive. Only 5% of the 1,000 replanted elkhorn corals were alive. At Luki, the southernmost of the reefs they looked at, we did not find any live elkhorn or staghorn coral, not wild, not planted, said coral biologist Katie Lesneski. She is research and monitoring coordinator for NOAA's effort. It's really horrible to witness, Lesneski said, just two days after the dives to observe coral had finished. Scientists blame human-caused climate change. They also note that the natural El Nino Pacific Ocean current affects weather in North America. They said these conditions are making the water too warm for the coral. Corals are small animal colonies that build rocky formations as they grow. There's still a lot of data to be collected to really understand, Lesneski said. She added, but we certainly have not seen something like this in recorded human history. Staghorn and elkhorn populations are important because they provide a structural framework for coral, Lesneski said. The scientists did see some wild coral alive and well, she said. Brain or boulder corals seemed to be doing better. The U.S. government and private groups plan to spend at least $97 million dollars to place coral species grown on land or in the ocean in seven places off the Florida Keys, the AP reports. Some of the species are native, and others have been crossbred to be hardier, Lesneski said. It is too early to tell which ones are better able to survive. Lesneski said NOAA measured water temperatures of 34 degrees Celsius at the planting places. Mark Egan is with the International Coral Reef Society. 
He said they were actually seeing temperatures that they didn't think were possible. Eakin and the University of Victoria coral biologist Julia Baum said the findings raise concerns about trying to repopulate coral reefs by cultivating coral in very warm water. Lesneski said she understands that concern, and researchers are looking to see what they could do to breed more heat-resistant coral. But for now, if we want to have reefs, we do have to do our best to conserve, be good stewards, and restore to the degree we can, she said. I'm Dan Novak. The Roman Catholic Church has been trying for years to inform the public that its secret collection of documents is not secret. The Vatican has opened documents of World War II period Pope Pius XII to researchers. It even changed the official name of the archive to remove the word secret. Recently, the chief of what is now called the Vatican Apostolic Archive, Archbishop Sergio Pagano, spoke to the Associated Press. Pagano told some of the secrets he had uncovered in the 45 years of working in the archive. The Vatican's archive is one of the world's most important stores of documents. In a new book-length interview called Secretum, Pagano explained some of the largely unknown details of the history of the Vatican and its relations with the outside world over the past 1,200 years. The interviews took place as discussions over a year with Italian reporter Massimo Franco. Pagano explains everything from French leader Napoleon taking documents to the 1922 financial support for the election of a pope from Catholics in the U.S. It's the first time. And it will also be the last, because I'm about to leave, said Pagano, who is 75. He also spoke to the AP before his expected retirement later this year. The archive has 85 kilometers of space for books, much of it underground, in a two-story fireproof, secure area. The archive works much as any national or private archive would. Researchers request permission to visit and then request documents to study in reading rooms. Most recently, researchers have been going to the archive to read through the documents of Pope Pius XII. He was the Pope who has been criticized for not speaking out against the Holocaust during World War II. Pope Francis ordered the documents of his office opened earlier than planned in 2020 so researchers could have a full picture of the papacy. In the book, Pagano criticizes incomplete research into the process of confirming the sainthood of Pius XII. Researchers are now examining newly available documents. Aside from old stories, Secretum also shares new ones. They include an important financial relationship between Catholics in the U.S. and the Vatican that continues today and dates back to 1922. 
Pagano said that after Pope Benedict the Fifteenth died, a financial official found that the Vatican had no money. The book shares secret messages in which the Vatican asked its ambassador in Washington D.C. to send what you have in the safe, so that the vote for a new pope could take place. The messages say the Vatican embassy sent two hundred ten thousand four hundred dollars and nine cents, collected from the American Catholics, that permitted the vote to elect Pope Pius the Eleventh. Pagano suggests that Francis's 2019 decision to remove the word "secret." From the archive's name and rename it, the Vatican Apostolic Archive was possibly a choice to gain donations. The U.S.-based group Treasures of History is aiming to support the newly renamed archive. At the end of the interview. Pagano showed visitors one of the archive's prized possessions. It is the 1530 letter from British nobles urging Pope Clement VII to permit King Henry VIII to end his marriage so he could marry Anne Boleyn. Clement refused. Henry got married anyway. He broke ties with the Catholic Church in Rome and established the Church of England. You can say that here we are at the birth of the Anglican Church, Pagano said. Pagano explained how the document survived. He said when Napoleon Bonaparte, the ruler of France, Took documents from the Vatican archives in 1810. The chief archivist at the time hid the letter. The French never found it. Pagano said, showing that he believed an archivist's main job is to preserve the archive. I'm Gina Bennett, and I'm Gregory Stockel. Students must learn academic writing and research methods when moving from high school to college. That is why universities require a first-year writing class. As experienced students move on to higher degrees, they continue learning how to do research and to write for academic publications. But learning the new writing methods. Can be difficult for international students," said Nat Smidable. He is a counselor for Ivywise, a company that helps students prepare their applications for top-level American universities. In the United States, Smidable said, most students have a basic understanding that they must give credit to, or cite. The sources of the words and ideas in their academic writing. For those who come from other countries, this can be new. Smidable said, "One of the most important lessons students new to the U.S. learn is this academic culture of really making sure you give other people credit in a formal way." Using another person's words without giving them credit is considered plagiarism. VOA Learning English recently prepared a guide for international students who need to learn more about plagiarism and why it is a serious concern. A plagiarism accusation recently led to Harvard University's president having to step down from her position. Smidable said, "The reason citations are difficult for international students 
is that teachers and professors overseas are more often concerned that students provide the correct answer to a question than showing the information source. Amjad Benshabayan agrees. He is a student at the English Language Center, or ELC, at Old Dominion University in Virginia. Benshabayan is from Yemen and also attended school in the United Arab Emirates. In Virginia, he takes classes with students from places like Greece, Spain, and Japan. They often discuss the academic differences between the U.S. and their countries. He said one of the first things ELC students learn is how to follow American University guidelines for recording source material. They also talk about writing papers without the help of artificial intelligence or AI tools. Benshabayan said it is easy for students who are learning how to write papers in English to depend on generative AI tools. These tools can change their grammar or make their writing easier to understand. However, after nearly a year at the ELC, he has, in his words, progressed a lot. I have been, like, improving since then, since the summer in 2023. Now I can, I can write, like, a whole, a whole assignment uh, without any outside source. I can read an article and understand it and write it in my own words. That's one of the techniques that, that I got since I come to the U.S. He said it is better to struggle with writing and adding citations to academic work early in college than to find out that you do not know how to do it later on. Smidobel noted that many universities will show students how to use tools such as the RefWorks Citation Manager. The computer tool permits students to carry out research online and collects all of the source material necessary. Meredith Bricker teaches in the English Language Institute at the University of Michigan. Many of her students are working on advanced degrees. That means they are learning and doing research on difficult academic subjects. She said the citation tools are both good and bad. On the one hand, they permit students to easily create a source list. On the other hand, they can prevent students from finding or understanding the best sources for a project. They're like, okay, fine, I'll just put whatever comes up in my search on my citation list, Bricker said. Students who come to Bricker's class are doing their own research, she added. They hope that they can make a discovery or create a new idea and be published in a journal. So the stakes are high for master's or PhD students compared to those just beginning college. She said, it is likely the people cited in a paper by one of her students will read it. In some ways it's more relevant, or, you know, like easy, almost easier for them to see the purpose and the point. But I think it's also the flip side of that is if they do it incorrectly, <laughs> it could have such um, devastating effects on their futures, you know, pretty immediately. International students who are caught using other people's ideas without citing them can be expelled or removed from school. That would cause them to be in violation of their F-1 student visa. At higher levels, a young researcher who is caught plagiarizing may have trouble finding another job. 
Bricker believes students should also give credit to AI tools whenever they use them. Gen AI is not going away, she said. Part of our job as writing teachers is to make sure students know the boundary between appropriate and inappropriate use. She said some academic journals will permit the use of artificial intelligence and others will not. It depends on the field, she said, noting that a linguistics journal might have different rules than an engineering journal. Bricker said she tells her students that it is difficult for teachers to know if their students are using AI tools, but as a writing teacher, it is her goal to help them learn to write on their own without help from a machine. I'm a teacher of writing, um, so letting my students know, I want to see your writing, you. I want to see what you're doing as a writer, and I want to help you grow as a writer. So I can do that, you know, with you using this and without you using this, but it's your choice. Bin Shabane said international students who are learning English in the U.S. are tempted by AI tools. But he advises students that they should use AI only for some things, like searching for sources. When I first came here, I was using it for everything, he said. But I stopped because I understand the best thing to do is to put the effort on learning. It's going to pay off in the future. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Gina Bennett. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Today, we talk about a way to share ideas, thoughts, and opinions. A bully pulpit. This common two-word noun sounds aggressive, but is it? Let's explore. We'll start with the word bully. Usually, when we use the word bully, we are talking about a person who is cruel or threatening to others. As a verb, if you bully someone, you treat them in a cruel, insulting, or aggressive way. Bullies usually threaten those who are weaker or smaller than them. Now the word pulpit. A pulpit is a raised platform used in preaching or conducting a worship service. So together, a bully pulpit sounds like a preacher who is bullying others. But that is not what it means. A bully pulpit is a public-facing position, especially a political office. It provides a way to share or spread your ideas widely. If you have a bully pulpit, you have a position of influence or power. Experts say that bully pulpit comes from the 26th president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. When he was in office, he once said, I suppose my critics will call that preaching, but I have got such a bully pulpit. Roosevelt observed that his time in office at the White House was a platform for speaking out for what he believed in. He could influence others. He understood that his presidency was his bully pulpit. When then-President Roosevelt used the term bully, he meant something excellent or first-rate. This is an older meaning of the word, and these days we often use it as an interjection, saying, bully for you, to cheer another's success. Now let's hear this term used in a short conversation. Hey, what are you doing this evening? Want to grab a bite? I wish I could, but I have a board meeting for my swimming pool. I thought you quit that board. 
I did, but I have to attend one last meeting to hand off my notes to the new secretary. Why are you quitting? I never heard the full story. I'm quitting because of the board president. She uses her position as a bully pulpit. Instead of making the pool better, she lectures the rest of us on all kinds of issues. It's a swimming pool. What issues come up? Oh, you name it. We have to hear her views on everything from recycling to dog parks to the evils of potato chips. Hey, if you have time, would you like to replace me on the board? Yeah, no thanks. While today bully pulpit is most often used in the world of politics, we can also use it in other areas. The president of a company can use that position as a bully pulpit. So can the principal of a school, leaders of media sites, interest groups, and more. And that's all the time we have for this words and their stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. I'm Dean Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English podcast. We just heard Ana Mateo tell us about a term you may be hearing as we head into the upcoming election season here in the U.S. Thanks for joining us today, Anna. Hi, Dan. You're welcome. Anna, let's get into this term, bully pulpit. Why is it a confusing phrase? Well, Dan, this is a compound term. That means it uses two words. If English learners know what bully and pulpit mean separately, it could be confusing. Bully is a person who tries to harm others, usually by threatening them physically or saying and doing things to make them feel badly. And a pulpit is where religious leaders stand when they give lessons or speeches. Anna, we talked last week about the influence presidents have on language in America. And here's another example. You're right. We talked about how Teddy Roosevelt is credited with creating a number of words and phrases, and Bully Pulpit is one of them. He knew that he had a great position of power to share his ideas and possibly influence others. But as I explained in my story, when Roosevelt used the term bully, he meant first rate. This is an older meaning of the word bully. Anna, why do you think our listeners should be aware of this term this year? The main thing is that people will be spending a lot of time listening to people with a bully pulpit. Have you ever seen a political rally? The candidates can get up on the stage and talk for a long time. That's true. People running for office often like to hear themselves speak. They sure do, Dan. But other people like to talk, too. Social media platforms have given people bully pulpits. We literally have the term influencers, people who try to influence others online from their social media platform or bully pulpit. That's a good point, Anna. Those social media influencers, they get right into your brain and make you think suddenly you need to buy a new item for your kitchen. Well, we don't want our listeners to think we're taking advantage of them or trying to influence them to do anything else but learn English. So we should probably say goodbye, don't you think? Sounds good, Dan. Goodbye, and thanks for having me. And that's the Learning English podcast for today. Thank you, Anna, for that report. And thanks to my VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, 
Thank you for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan.